new supply, new narcissist. I mean, right? This is what we see. We see it a lot. And people ask this question a lot. And they're very hurt by the fact that the narcissist does new things or changes their ways or acts a certain way around the new supply. When a narcissist meets someone that they would like in their supply pocket, they groom. So basically, the reason that they um, change isn't because they're actually changing, have had a change of heart, are happy now. A lot of people are, are think, oh, he's so happy. She's so happy with the new supply. They're, the narcissist is, is finally acting happy. And it, so there's a much better, they, that's a better person than me, that it was my fault. I was the problem, blah, blah, blah. They're not actually happy. What they're happy about is that their perfect idealized state of relationship exists at this time. When they're in the beginning with anything, they are in the idealization phase of the relationship. So they appear happy and they give that person, you know, they love bomb. They're doing that to that other person. It That isn't real. That never was real. The love bombing in the beginning is part of the grooming process. What is grooming? Grooming, basically it sets an image in the victim survivor, in the, in the target's mind of the, of the narcissist. So it's setting an image that you will see them as. It's a created state. It's a created image that they're setting of themselves that you see them as. That's why people, almost every person says, I wish it could be like it was in the beginning. I just want to get it back to when it was good. I just want it to be like that. I want them to be that person. Why can't they be that person? I saw them be that person. Why can't they still be that person? You know, it's very confusing because you think, well, if you're just happy, then you're in a good state. Everyone in the beginning of any relationship is kind of happy, right? That's not grooming. Grooming is when they're faking, they're faking a persona. They're faking a, a whole, they're putting on a huge mask that is exactly what they want you to see in order to get you to believe that's who they are. And why do that? Because they can control you then. They control the situation. If it's all been created, then they can control what happens. So um, they want to appear things like trustworthy. They want to appear like you. They want to appear similar. They want to appear like you have commonality or similarities. And if you don't, they want to appear like the best teacher or the most exciting person to show you new ways of doing things so that you become like them, right? So they want this commonality. We all want commonality. It's different than wanting to be around like-minded people. This is a created state. They don't actually like, you know, uh, I don't know, ice skating, but they will pretend to in order to make you think they do so that you have this similarity and these commonalities. Usually it's, or often they do find things that they kind of like or they're kind of good at and they go seek supply there because that's easier. That's like the lazy narcissist. You know, they can go, oh, I like I like rock climbing. So I'm going to go find a rock climbing piece of supply. And, and, you know, that's easy because then we have these things in common where this you're never going to have everything in common with someone. But they try and pull as many things as they can to make it seem the same. And where they're not the same, they like to be completely unusual sometimes so that you're fascinated by the newness of them. Okay, they also, when they're grooming, um, they want to appear like the perfect partner or maybe not. Maybe they want to appear like the perfect um, project, right? Because they know that you are people pleasing and somewhat codependent. They may want to appear like they're broken and wounded and that they need you and you need them, right? They want, they, they build in the need through this grooming. It disarms you when they do this and it stops you from looking at the red flags because what you're looking at is all this familiarity. You basically think you found a soulmate. You think you found the real deal. All right. That's what they're trying to, that's what they're setting up. And it's all done kind of on purpose. It's how they, it's how they enter into things. And when you stop looking for red flags, you know, um, and it's creating an image that you believe in. So they're creating an image that you believe is who they are. That's what they're doing when they're grooming. Okay. They will, this is straight from one's mouth. They will set up situations when they're meeting someone so that, that your first impression is that of which you want to see. They create a lens by which you look through to see them. 
And then once that per first impression is set, they can maintain it for a while and you will always believe that that's who they are. Then when things change, it's your fault. You see? Okay. Okay, so when they're doing this to new supply, when they're doing this to someone new, it's the same process. What you're just seeing is it from the outside. You're seeing it from the understanding of what they really look like, of who they really are. And you're confusing their happy demeanor appearance with happiness. And you're confusing the new supplies, um, happiness and such, and getting and, and thinking that they're getting what you, you should have because you're the one that put in the time and the effort toward a relationship with this person and they just go give the goodness to someone else. They're not giving goodness. They are, this is the worst part of abuse to me because this is the hook. This is the hook that stays there that's within the trauma bond cycle. When you, the thing that's hardest to let go of is this hope. This is the creation of hope in a relationship. Okay, it's the ultimate future faking. I will be what I say I am right now. That's the ultimate future faking when it's not true because they, they're not that thing, all right? So, all right, um, so let it, let's look at some ways in which they groom the new supply so that you can see the ways that they create this changed persona, that they're not a changed person. We have to remember, to remember that, okay? Number one, they're mirroring. If you're mirroring someone, you're gonna change. We all mirror to some degree. It's part of, it's part, okay, empaths will mirror because of the empathy that we feel for someone, we actually feel it on the inside and so our whole demeanor can change because we are actually feeling the experience of that other person and it can it's a different kind of thing. A narcissist mirrors to gain information, take in that information and wear a mask to maintain a situation under their control. They wear the mask because they don't have the true self there to, I mean, they don't, well, they wouldn't, don't wanna show you, okay? All right. Another way that they groom people is they fish for information. So when you're getting to know one, they will start digging for info and fishing for info from you and then start piecing stories together often that, that match that info. Also what they're fishing for in that info is your vulnerability, are your vulnerabilities. So they're looking for things to to keep you there. They're looking for things to keep, to get you addicted to them, to hook you in so you don't, because they need supply, okay? They need someone to think that, to worship and adore them is the words, again, straight from their mouths, <laughs> right? They need that, um, they need that sort of attention. Uh, they, with that kind of fishing for info, they can read your needs like kind of like antenna out there, grabbing information, grabbing, looking for your vulnerability. So for instance, if you are a person who has had bad, bad relationships and you're a really sweet person and you don't know why these bad people have been in your life and people have abandoned you and you've got this total fear of abandonment and you're, you're, you're entering into something with someone that's a narcissist and, and they're, um, they're seeming really supportive of that. They're like, yeah, they get you because they've had abandonment too, or that, that must really hurt. Yeah, I know. And then they'll suddenly leave you little messages, like send you little texts out of nowhere. Like I'll never leave you. I'll always be by your side. Um, I'm right here. They'll be like so ultra supportive of that, of that vulnerability. They're grooming you to trust them. They're grooming you in to, to trust that they are the answer to all these problems that you've had in your life, all right? Okay, um, here's the one that answers the question of do they, is, are they a new person? No, they're not a new person. They're presenting a false self. They're presenting a false self because they're, like I said in the beginning, they're setting up a situation because that's what they want you to appear like. So maybe, you know, they aren't going to continue to do these hobbies and things with the person unless it's something that they actually like doing, but they'll hold it for a while to give the pretense. And then what they'll eventually do is sabotage that thing. So say you are a, I don't know, a, a runner and they, they take up running with you and they're running all the time with you. And then suddenly they'll make it so you can't make it out to run before 6 p.m. when it's pouring rain or suddenly they'll start sabotaging that very thing you love. So you see it eventually breaks down. I mean, oftentimes 
it's really hard not to have negative feelings toward new supply, but truly, and, and as a fact, they are the next victim of the narcissist. So, and, you know, I mean, there's some situations where the new supply is just as toxic. And so you can't really look at it that way. But a lot of times the person has been innocently lied to, or they've been, they are innocent because they have been lied to and they have been manipulated. And, you know, then the, when the narcissist goes to groom them, they're telling them, oh, well, we'll get to this. Another way of grooming is future faking, future faking. You're hanging out for one day and you suddenly you're on a vacation somewhere and you're going to have this happen and you're going to have that happen and you've done them for a week and suddenly this is, you know, but these things are never going to happen. That's not planning. That's not hope and daydreaming together. It's total future faking. They future the entire setup of their putting on the fake mask to begin with of the lens that you're looking through not being real is future faking. Okay, they're saying this is me, this is who I am, and this is who I will be in the future. Because isn't that what you do when you meet someone new and you're going to date someone? Are you not putting forth who you are because you want that person to know you and love you for who you are? You're not, you're trying to be as least fake as you can, right? You're trying to be as honest and authentic most of the time as you can. And we all have, you know, things we hide and things we change a little bit when we meet someone. But I mean, for the most part, when you're seriously, you know, dating or whatever, and you're, or making a friend or something, you're not like, how can I pretend to be this so that they like me? I mean, that's like, I don't even know what. <laughs> and it's not mature, that's for sure. And it doesn't last. And we all know it. We all know we cannot maintain that. So we, most of us, at least at this point in, in time, by the time we've been abused by narcissists, we really just want to be seen and, and accepted for who we are, right? So when we meet someone, we're not putting something fake out there. So the ultimate in future faking is this mask that they put on in the beginning. It's this new, this new person that they become. Okay. They also, I think um, another reason that they change for new supply is they get bored and they want, it's like a new toy. So it may be a hobby. It may be a lifestyle. It may be a anything. They're having fun doing it. It's new and exciting. It, I mean, anyone would have fun doing something new for a little while, right? But the difference is they pretend that this is how they always were, or they pretend that this is something they've always wanted to do, all right? It's not real. And they're mirroring what they see in you to tailor it to that thing so that it keeps you there. They play on your empathy. When they're grooming you, they are often sometime, often sometimes, they are sometimes, um, uh, playing the victim. My ex was so crazy. You don't even know how hard I tried to make it work. They were just crazy. They were always after me. My ex put me down so much. I have no, I have no self-esteem left. I just don't. They were always putting me down. My, you know, and so what are you thinking? You're thinking, wow, you seem great. You actually are perfect for me. You seem like a soulmate. I would never do that. I would never, I mean, your ex must be, that must be terrible. And so they're doing that. This is all part of the grooming. It's part of the, what is pulling you in and making you trust them. If someone exposes a vulnerability to you, do you not trust them? Right? As soon as, soon as you have those deep conversations, do you not feel connection? It's what we're after, right? Connection. And a narcissist will do this and play on your empathy and pull you in and there begins the soulmate fake out, right? Okay. Um, another thing is when they're grooming and the older they get, especially like into their 40s and 50s, if they've been doing this with multiple people and have not had long standing relationships, but they've had multiple relationships, whatever, they are refining their techniques. They're refining their techniques for how to groom. They're, they're learning shortcuts. Okay. This way they are setting the rules for how the entire relationship will play out. Any deviance on your part from the way they set up the grooming, when they're setting up a groom, the grooming thing, when they're putting that mask on and they're creating a lens that you see them through, they're also creating a version of you that responds to that person. Does that make sense? 
they're playing into your codependency. They're playing into your people pleasing. They're playing into your the parts of you that it could be anything. But that so say they're say that they tap into your nurturing side. You can only be that nurturing person then, because they've created this lens that they look that you see them through that becomes the basis of the relationship. The relationship isn't about you and them intermingling like a healthy relationship would be where a little bit of you, a little bit of me, and we, you know, figure it out how to relate. It's not about relating. It's about, it's, you know, it's transactional experience with, with a narcissist. So they are creating this mask that for the new supply, for you, for whoever they're they're grooming, they're creating what the relationship looks like based on the mask that they're putting on. So if what they're bringing out in you is your sense of nurturing, you know how it is as an empath, we tend to give people the parts of ourselves <laughs> that they need, right? And, and the more we lean toward codependency, the more that is true. That's why it's super important to heal and learn to hold yourself separate from other people and hold and to not give, 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 especially in the beginning with anyone so that you can actually see what it is you're giving and getting from the, you know, where is the exchange? Where's the comment? The, where's the coming together anyway? So they're creating this thing. And if you deviate from that, so say you're just not feeling like being a giver today, you're tired, you're not giving the devaluing escalates right? If the new supply is nice and kind and does everything right by the narcissist standards, what makes the narcissist devalue and find other new supply? Why don't they just stay content? Well, number one, the narcissist was never content to begin with. What they were doing is power playing. Can you imagine doing that? Imagine you have an innocent person. I mean, just imagine for a second the power you would feel. Not saying it's going to feel good to imagine this, saying you're going to feel power, all right? To, to be able to manipulate someone through making them think you're something, okay? Imagine, imagine the way it feels when you're an actor on stage, and if this is on a more positive light. Imagine being an actor on stage and portraying a character so much you have the audience gripped and staring and believing you are that thing for those moments. The kind of... The kind of um, what it must feel like to someone to be able to create that, they're doing that in real life, okay? That's a lot of power and control over someone else. They aren't content with the relationship with the person. They're content in the manipulation of the person. And it's not even a contentment. It's a rising of, it's probably, a you know, all kinds of chemical reaction in their body that has to do with what power and control feel like. They don't have um, boredom too. Yes, boredom. So yeah, they can get bored because it's not new anymore, because it's not exciting, because there isn't a challenge. Of course, they can get bored. Even if that person could read the boredom, even if it was like the most extremely perfect supply for that particular narcissist and person could read the person's mood and tailor their mood to fit exactly what the narcissist leave, they would still get bored because they're not content inside themselves, they're not happy inside themselves, and they don't have anything real inside their own personality to anchor to, okay? So they're just literally feeding off supply all the time. All right, um, nightmare dressed as a daydream, that's right. Um, well, we're saying, okay, so they don't, they don't, uh, and also, there is no such thing as nice, kind, perfect supply. You don't know what is perfect because they've put on a mask to begin with, all right? So perfect meaning sticking with the idealization. If the person sticks with the idealized image of who that person was supposed to be and never deviates from it, they would probably feel like they were with a robot and they wouldn't want it. It's not supply. Part of the supply you have to remember is in the devaluing that they they enjoy and need that um, they'll all tell you or a lot of them will tell you they hate drama. But my goodness, I mean, one thing like going back to looking at dating sites, if somebody on their um, on their bio mentions the word drama and how they're not into it, to me, that's like instant no. 
Yeah, right. Okay. Nobody, nobody likes drama. Okay. But if you got to put that there, there's some reason you're putting it there. <laughs> Just, especially the people who do it, put it more than once often. No drama, no BS. Okay. All right. Uh, then stop creating it maybe. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so they don't stay content. They don't, um, what was I going to say about that? It's in the seeking of new supply. Oh, I wish I had the list of the pros and cons of lease. There was one, the pros and cons. And it literally read like a list of, read like a supply list. Uh -huh. The pros were all like my pro of supply and the cons were all things that you could get better elsewhere. Uh. <gasps> Yeah, if that wasn't enough to go, okay, that's, I'm out. <laughs> that's, that is telling, right? So it's, oh yeah, his list. The list of what's, yeah, the pros and cons. Not of the relationship or of like, that wasn't even actually personal. It was very supply oriented. Um, cooks for me types of things, you know? And then on the other side, um, I'd have more varied experiences with other women, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, I've got it somewhere too. I just don't have it available to pull out and read right now. <laughs> but, uh, huh. So, um, anyway, they, there is no perfect supply is what I'm getting at. You can, if you're still with a narcissist and you're thinking, if I just changed my ways, if I just, if I just tried a little harder, if I just did things better, if I would, if I would be less argumentative, if I would stop questioning them when they get home, you know, late, if I'd stop, you know, checking up on them, if I'd stop, if I'd only do this, it, none of that is going to help anything. They are, they're seeking, uh, it's not about you. Okay, those that the reasons you feel that way is because you have been gaslighted back to that question into believing everything is your fault. All right. And that there's anything you can do about it. A healthy relationship doesn't include any of this. Okay. All right. Um, I saw my ex for the first time. Hi, Arrow Girl. Since no contact, walk by each other opposite direction. And I waved nothing else. I read journal notes to remind me of what he was. How are you feeling now? Did that just happen? How are you feeling now about it? And um, it's good that you had those notes, right? To remind yourself. Okay. Um, I think that's it for this topic. Anything else you guys want to talk about with grooming or new supply? Any words? Of so if you've not hit subscribe to this channel, hit the subscribe. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoy this. Pass the information along to anyone that needs it. I'm Lise Colucci, and I'm one of the life coaches at queenbeing.com.